just wait for some more time you are live live on youtube i'm just waiting for the facebook to go live it has few seconds more yes so you are all set live okay. you can start you can start i am dr jay as an international president for world congress of ophthalmic anesthesia i would like to welcome you all for this webinar the first virtual wca meet on covid changes in ophthalmic anesthesia practice hosted by shankar netralaya in this virtual meet we have surgeons and anesthetists from reputed big institutes in india as well as from other parts of the globe to discuss analyze and share experience in dealing with patients undergoing covid ophthalmic surgery during this covid pandemic time now although the meeting is virtual but hope to substantiate what we will say by saying by published literature we have interesting topics to discuss ranging from pre op to post operative management of patients undergoing eye surgery in the covid scenario now i will be introducing the panelist but first i will introduce my co moderator professor chandra m kumar from singapore professor chandra he is a I... senior consultant from kutak pau hospital singapore and visiting professor in newcastle university hello mr Pro hello professor chandra he is the founder hi hi, hi. he is the founder for british ophthalmic anesthesia society and also for this world congress of ophthalmic anesthesia he is the lead editor for the book titled ophthalmic anesthesia published in 2001 by sweets and Zeltinger and Oxford and Book of Ophthalmic Anesthesia published in 2012. He is one of the co-editor for the book titled Principles and Practice of Ophthalmic Anesthesia published in 2017 and he has edited seven other textbooks in anesthesia and has numerous publications to his credit in the field of ophthalmic anesthesia. I welcome Professor Chandra M Kumar to this meet. Thank you very much Jai. It's now my pleasure to welcome you all the delegates on the YouTube and the Facebook um the man who is talking to you is dr jai so he didn't say much about it so i will give a brief introduction about him he is the mastermind for this meeting he is currently a consultant and a physiologist at sankar netrale he is an elected president of the world congress of ophthalmic anesthesia 2020 which will be held in russia he is also the secretary of the ofisa which is of the uh, ophthalmic forum of indian society of anesthesiologists he is the chief editor of the textbook uh, principle and practice of ophthalmic anesthesia and i'm fortunate to be one of the co editor of that book jai has innovated so many things but recently in this covid period he had introduced or innovated a needle block and sarcinone block stimulator which you will see some of the uh, pra practical application of that he is the scientific vice chair of the third turkish uh, congress and he was organizing secretary for the fourth world congress of ophthalmic anesthesia and as i mentioned he also got some innovation during covid period which he will talk to you later so now i'll pass it back to you jai thank you thank you professor chandra now i will be introducing panelists from india dr raja narsingh rao dr raja hello hello everybody yeah. Uh, he is a consultant in lv prasad i institute hyderabad and he was the organizing secretary for the fourth ofisa con held at lvpa hyderabad and he is also the consultant for emergency management learning center gvk ermi 108 services he is also a regional faculty for american heart association basic and advanced life support and pediatric advanced life support i welcome raja thank you jay Now uh, move on to next panelist, Dr. Girish Shivarao. Dr. Girish. Hi, Dr. Jay. Yeah. So he is a senior veterinary consultant and also the president for Medical Research Foundation, Shankar Netralaya. It's a real pleasure and honor to have you with us, sir, in this meet. I welcome Dr. Girish. Thank you for the invite. Next, Dr. Ravi Chandar. He is a chief consultant, Department of Anesthesia, Aravind Eye Care System, Madurai, Tamil Nadu. 
and he has delivered lecture at various national anesthesiologist and ophthalmologist conference welcome dr ravi hello thank you for the invitation next move on to the next panel dr renu sinha hello dr renu he is a professor of anesthesiology rpi center all india institute of medical science new delhi she has received aims excellence research award in the year 2014 and she has been awarded certificate of appreciation for contribution in stanford india bio design and she is an active member of aos indian association of pediatric anesthesia and indian obstetric anesthesia society i welcome professor renu sinha to this forum now moving on to Moving okay, on to on. Chandra, you can introduce. It's my pleasure now to introduce the international speaker. The first person on my list, according to the alphabet, is Dr. Alfred Chua. He's a good friend of mine, and you can see he's smiling at me. Hi, Alfred. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, so Alfred is a senior <laughs> consultant in East Cities in Sydney, with a special interest in anesthesia for ophthalmic. and major musculoskeletal tumor surgery he had published widely and presented in many ophthalmic anesthesia and i tell you he is a lead person for the workshop in ophthalmic anesthesia for ansca asa and the world congress of ophthalmic anesthesia he was the scientific chair of the fifth world congress of ophthalmic anesthesia earlier this year in jakarta and he was he done a very very good job so thank you dr alfred My Thank next you for speaker, Dr. Oya Cho. Hi, Oya. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi, Oya. Oya is a consult professor of anesthesiology at Baskent University School of Medicine, Ankara, Turkey. Currently, she is working as a consultant at Adana Research and Education Center as well. She has lectured widely and conducted workshop and topics related to ophthalmic anesthesia, regional anesthesia, palliative care. pain medicine at both national and international meeting she was the organizing secretary for the third world congress of ophthalmic anesthesia which was held in ankara in 2012 so thank you dr oya my thank next speaker much. is dr tommy hi tom he is from england hi tom are you gone off tom no i'm i'm muted uh, thanks for having me oh, good to be here hi tom So Tom is a rear breed. He is an ophthalmologist, ah, huh? but he is interested in anesthesia. He has published quite a lot. So, and his main interest is actually improving techniques of local anesthesia since 1990. So, if you look at a lot of publication, it would be in the name of Tom Eek. He has published so much on ophthalmic anesthesia. Currently, um, he works mostly without anesthetists. and he said that he is still looking for that perfect combination of safety comfort efficiency and patient experience so thank you tom my next speaker is dr mohammad mukhtar he is a clinical assistant professor hi mukhtar hi chandra thanks sir for the invitation hi. so mohammad is a assistant clinical assistant professor at the university college at dublin and a practicing consultant in anesthesia in vincent vincent university hospital and royal victoria eye and ear hospital dublin he had been running of thermic anesthesia meeting in dublin for last 15 year and i can tell you i did at go i was invited last year in dublin and it's a wonder wonderful meeting i can tell you it was so much of praise by the ophthalmologist uh, mukhtar has conducted lectured widely and he has also conducted of thermic anesthesia regional anesthesia workshop so then the last speaker for me is professor harvard palte he is from hello. usa hi harvard hello chandra thank you for the invitation a uh, great great harvard so he the, he originally graduated from uh, he graduated from south africa then he moved to us he is currently a professor of anesthesiology at a very famous institute called baskam palmer eye institute his chief interest include of thermic regional and ambulatory he had widely published on subjects such as ultrasound and anesthesia safety so welcome uh, harvard thank you chandra okay so hand over to jay now yeah thank you professor chandra now before we start the meeting i would like to mention that today's meeting is not a didactic lecture 
now please have the scientific program have a look at it we will be covering these topics for the next 90 minutes also we will be covering some accepts of general anesthesia but not much in detail so we will be covering mostly surgeries under regional anesthesia since most of the procedures in this current scenario is carried out under regional anesthesia so for each topic we will be having a 10 minutes time allotted so if there are any formal presentations associated with questions the panelists will present for no more than 5 minutes other panelists will be asked to participate in the remaining 5 minutes now for the audience those who are in the youtube channel or the facebook channel you can type your questions in the comment section in the facebook or in your youtube comment section at the end of the discussion either myself or chandra will raise your questions to the panel at following all these panelist question and answers so we will try to answer as many as questions as possible but we will not be able to answer the whole thing let us see now we will start the proceedings without the delay now coming to the first topic that is suitability of eye surgical procedures chandra would you mind asking some of the panelists any questions of course of course thank you so my first question would be going to uh, dr girish dr girish no. uh, dr girish had not given me any any slide but the question to you girish is what type of eye surgery were you carried out during the lockdown period in in your institute that's your first question so in india Hi, girish hello sir so in india Hi. we had lockdown from the end of march and we had four lockdowns so during the first two lockdowns lockdown 1 and 2 the restrictions were very severe and the patient people movements was very limited and that's why our surgeries during those two periods were restricted purely to emergency surgeries like surgeries for endophthalmitis uh, corneal perforations due to infections globe traumas globe ruptures and tears we also performed laser surgeries for ropes and uh, for ocular tumors like retinoblastoma surprisingly because of the severe restrictions we saw very few road traffic incidents uh, or road traffic uh, related eye injuries during the second part of the lockdown that is lockdown 3 and 4 with the easing of the restrictions there was lot more patient movement so people could access the healthcare facility and that's when we started doing semi emergency surgeries like retinal detachments surgeries for diabetic retinopathy or hypertensive retinopathies glaucomas uh, pediatric cataracts a few adult cataracts especially those which which had uh, total or near total cataracts and also a few non orbital uh, oculoplastic surgeries so we kind of graduated from pure emergency surgeries to doing a little more of elective surgeries during this later half of the lockdown okay now the next question to you girish thank you very much is that there are surgical procedure we know they are aerosol generating which i said do you think is the most aerosol generating procedure um from the ophthalmology point of view it's the orbital surgeries which are the most aerosol generating especially because they require a lot of bone cutting procedures and there is an extensive use of cautery during the surgeries all of these tend to cause a significant aerosol generation even axonal laser surgeries which causes laser ablation of the corneal surface uh, can potentially have a lot of aerosol generation phaco emulsification uh, also has a potential for generating aerosol but luckily it's done in a intraocular closed milieu so the aerosol generation is kind of uh trapped within the anterior chamber within a closed chamber that's why there is not much of aerosol okay. but I'd, i'd like to point out that the aerosols which come from the ocular tissue is not of the same infectivity as an aerosol which comes out either from the nose or from a mouth of a patient who is either asymptomatic or a covid positive so the okay. infectivity is definitely different between these two groups thank you very much Grace. Now I would like to hover the uh, podium to Jai. Yeah. Okay. I have a couple of questions to Tom. Have your colleagues adopted any different approaches to surgery because of COVID and AGP issues, Tom? 
Yeah, so this is, thanks. So this is following on from uh, Girish's, uh, what Girish was saying. Um, the situation in the UK is probably the same as everywhere else. It's changing very rapidly. Um, what, we, what we did last week will not be the same as what we did next week. Um, just to follow on what Girish was saying about FACO, FACO emulsification, there was a lot of argument, is it aerosol generating or not? And there's a very good thing on YouTube, which there's the link on the next slide, um, which shows, uh, it was done by Bristol Eye Hospital people to show that uh, yes, aerosol, uh, um, FACO is aerosol generating, um, but it's just the fluid from the irrigation aspiration, which is generated. So if you have a very tight corneal wound and if you put viscoelastic on the wound, then that will stop all the spray from coming up. Um, if you really want to be careful, then if you do irrigation aspiration on the FACO probe, first of all, for six seconds, then that means that you've removed all of the aqueous from the anterior chamber, certainly. But uh, as Girish says, it's, it's, uh, it, it, we're not expecting much virus in the, anterior, in the aqueous anyway. Um, plus, of course, the povidone iodine. Povidone iodine uh, kills the, you know, the SARS virus, the MERS virus, and it is thought that the povidone iodine that we all put on at the beginning um, should kill the virus. So it should be a low risk procedure. So just move on to the next slide, please, uh, Jay. Um, the, um, so the College of Ophthalmologists is saying that yes, FACO is aerosol generating, but probably not an infective aerosol generating. So the current guidance in the UK is that um, uh, if the surgeon and the team want to wear one of those um, high uh, FFP3 masks, you can, but you don't have to. Um, diathermy, uh, as Gary was saying, uh, is listed as an aerosol generating procedure. However, I did check just this morning beforehand on the Public Health England website, and it's not there on their list now. Um, but uh, certainly high speed drilling things, dentistry, and so the orbital drilling still is. So the current guidance is uh, in the UK, obviously you know, local anaesthetic rather than general. Um, and certainly where I am, we get the patient to wear a mask and uh, we put extra drapes on so that the patient's breath doesn't go near the surgeon. Thank you, Tom. Now, I have one more question to Tom. Have we changed the number and type of operations done at our institution because of COVID? Um, yes, well, well, a bit similar to what Girish was saying. I think there, there is a slide there. Yeah, we, we started out doing only emergency stuff. At the moment, we're, we're, we should be reopening um, 1st of June, uh, Monday, uh, but still we're deferring quite a lot of the, you know, the soon operations. And, and if our operation is likely to be difficult, if we're at high risk of dropping the nucleus, for example, we'll, we'd like to defer that for another few weeks uh, because we need to limit not only the number of patients coming into the operating suite, but also we're very limited on the number of patients we're allowed to bring back to the clinic for post objects. So, um, so a lot of, we call it social distancing in the UK. Um, a lot of my glaucoma patients, the, even the, the ones that would have had an urgent trabeculectomy, we now do a diode laser instead because it's fewer follow-ups. Um, the college is saying some patients might be eligible for bilateral surgery just to minimize the, the number of follow-ups. Um, and we're not allowing the trainees to operate at the moment either because you know, we want everything to run uh, smoothly and quickly and just get the patients in and out. So that's the current situation in the UK. It might be different in a few weeks. Okay, thank you, Tom. Now, that is the update from Norwich. Now we will move on to update from Ireland. Dr. Mukhtar, we just want to know how did you plan and schedule surgery during COVID pandemic at your institution? Uh, thanks, Jay. And from Ireland, uh, if you ask me, we are much safer now because of the new PCR system and testing and the cocooning and the self-isolation. But when pandemic started as a being a chair of anesthesia department, we got the huge challenge because the exposure happened to the staff members and the people gone onto the isolation and there was a huge number and as the test was limited. So we set up the few uh, principles for the, from the island point of view, because as we are the national center for ophthalmology and also we provide the you know, uh, uh, cancer service. So we decided that only urgent and emergency surgery that cannot be delayed should go ahead. We established the surgical hub. In that surgical hub, there were senior team members, the consultant anesthesiologist uh, as the chairman and the consultant surgeon who is the chairman of the ophthalmology and the theater manager who got the mobile number uh, which was available to all staff members 24 hours a day. So we have the daily 
Zoom meeting to look at how and discuss the progress of the day and also to plan for the next day. And we have the frequent departmental meetings and interdepartmental meetings to discuss the challenges and to establish the guidelines because it, as uh, Tom mentioned rightly, that the, it, the changes were happening so frequently that you have to be up to the speed. And we established the lead role in every specialty to set up the guidelines. For example, we are surgeons were setting up their guidelines to define what are the urgent, what are the emergency cases, what case can be discussed. And we are the, provide the ENT service as well. So same thing given the role because high aerosol and that's given to them. And the recommendation was discussed. Okay. And we established the occupational health role and established a WhatsApp group to upload the guidelines. So one WhatsApp group was from a consultant and one a WhatsApp group from the consultants and trainees. So immediate guidelines are shared and for ready and quick access and for good communication. Thank you, thank you. Now we will get the update from Turkey. Professor Wayakko, how did your institution act during this period? Have you had any ophthalmic cases? How was it? Uh, thank you, Jay. Uh, actually, we started with the governmental uh, regulations, uh, but before the confirmation of the first COVID positive cases in Turkey, we started to prepare the clinics, wards, and ICUs for COVID. And we allocated the physicians according to their specialties to work in these parts. And we started producing our own PPE uh, with our institution. After the first case uh, at our institution and becoming a pandemic hospital, we stopped all elective cases and we just took the emergency cases. And meanwhile, during this time, we had around uh, 1800 surgeries of which uh, of them were 36 was ophthalmic cases. And these were uh, real emergencies like foreign body removal or uh, some tumor resections. Uh, then we start to plan elective surgeries. Meanwhile, if the stabilization part, uh, periods uh, follows afterwards. But uh, I want to mention here that how we selected our patients as emergencies. Uh, we did it according to some regulations and recommendations. Our institutional policy was to follow Turkish ophthalmological associations, guidelines and recommendations in concordance with Turkish Republic uh, Ministry of Health. Here we had a guideline like this in our country uh, however, however, I know that this may not apply to every country. So what I can suggest, or in my opinion, the regulations uh, to follow during this period can be the guidelines of respected national uh, or global associations. I'm sure that my, uh, as previously and later on in this discussion, my colleagues will mention other guidelines. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vaya. Now, moving back to India again, Dr. Ravi from Aravind. I just want to know whether the ocular trauma cases increased during the period of lockdown in your places. Yes, it is definitely, I can say yes only. But only thing is the spectrum has changed. The children are getting more injured because of the long lockdown and the parental supervision is less. In fact, the Children are seeing the movies and the TV medias and try to explore something and get injured. In the olden days, the, the supervision from the school is very much vigilant. So the incident of injury, the school is less. Now the parental long lockdown, the parental guidance is losing. So they get injured. In fact, the, because of these uh, shops are closed and the domestic injuries are very much different nowadays. The adult injuries are less the road traffic accident is very, very much less. So the injuries is more towards the children. But after this lockdown period is over, when the liquor shops are little open, I could see some adult also get injured. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Now, Professor Chandra, I believe you have some important information to share on recommendations of procedure during COVID. Can you please share with us? Yes. Thank you, Jaya. Yes, there is. And this is the, the one I have found it on the American Academy of Ophthalmologists. And what they have done, 
they have contacted all these five, six major organizations and they got together and they produced a list of surgery and their indication. Now, I tried to make this, uh, this website work, but it didn't unfortunately work on this Zoom thing. So what I have done very briefly, I'll go through, and I won't go through all the procedure, but I'll just show you the list and how they are organized on the website. So if you want to know more about it, please do go and visit the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Mm. And this is a very, very good and comprehensive site. So on, you can see on the one left-hand side, there's a surgical procedure. On the other side, there are indications. So if you go through the procedure, they're all listed and the indications are there. So these are more surgical procedure, more indications written there. So these are cases could be done during the COVID period. So as you can see, this is a pretty comprehensive list and you got to have a good reason why this case, particular case would be done. Okay, so please do visit American Academy of Ophthalmology for a full list of these. I mean, obviously every country will have its own regulation, own thinking, the financial involved, the patient and whatnot. There are so many logistic factors involved. So please, these are, these are the list I have. Uh, thanks, Jai. Okay, almost we have come to the end of the first uh, topic. Is there any panelists, any important comments to share? Okay. I just had one comment. They yeah, are regarding yeah. the unique injuries, uh, what happens? What happened during this time was because of the lockdown and uh, because the a popular serial of Mahabharat was re-aired in the Indian uh, television. So bow and arrow. the children were influenced by the bow and arrow, <laughs> and apparently there has been an upward incidence of bow and arrow injuries for oh. children, which we had seen. Uh, a decade ago and it had stopped when the serial stopped but now with the re-telecast we have these injuries again reappearing. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Girish. It's something interesting news to share from India actually. So now with this we have come to the end of the first topic. Over to Chandra for the second topic. Okay. Thank you very much Jai. Now the second is obviously it's a pre-anesthetic investigation other than routine. So the first I would like to ask Dr. Girish um, was COVID testing done for all surgical cases in your institute, Dr. Girish? Yes, sir. So our protocols mandated that COVID test be done only for patients who had influenza-like illness, who were high-risk contacts, or for patients who came from within the containment zone. We decided that COVID-positive patients would be referred to specific COVID-designated hospitals if they required an ophthalmic surgery. Regarding COVID testing for elective surgeries, we basically followed the uh, regional state government directives. So in Chennai, Tamil Nadu, the state government followed the ICMR guidelines, wherein COVID testing was mandated only if the patients had either the influenza-like illness, uh, a high-risk contact, or from the containment zone. Whereas our other center, which was in Kolkata, West Bengal, followed the West Bengal pattern and initially the West Bengal government mandated that any patient undergoing either an elective or emergency surgery had to have a COVID test. Now the West Bengal government has revised its guidelines and it is now following the ICMR guidelines. So we have drawn our uh, mandatory pre-operative COVID testing in West Bengal and we do it only on case basis. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Girish. Now I'll move on to Dr. Howard Palte, Prof. Howard Palte. What COVID-directed preoperative investigations are necessary prior to eye surgery? And when should these tests be done and on what are their limitations? So thank you, Howard. Thank you, Chandra. Well, it's important for us to know what the COVID status of a patient is. A, for to, to trace patients who are actually COVID positive and further to trace for contacts. And then of course, we do want to know for healthcare personnel safety, we need to know, but there is a degree of a modicum of confusion about what the COVID tests are and how significant they may be. Now, in general, COVID tests are divided into two main subtypes, either molecular or serological, looking for antibodies. Now, in the United States, there's been a, um, the Food and Drug Administration in the first month of the outbreak of the uh, coronavirus um, pandemic, there were more than 30 manufacturers who had been approved for 
a molecular tests and more than 10 manufacturers that have been approved for their tests on serological uh, based um, testing. And the types of turnover these times of these tests varies greatly. Um, they vary from routine tests, which may take two to three days or at best a few hours to on the spot tests, which could be done at home. Uh, Abbott has now got a test that takes five minutes and the information and efficiency and uh, relevance of these tests can be quite confusing. Next slide. So the molecular test is basically a test used to detect the presence of viral genetic material in the sample. Uh, it relies on what is called the reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction or RC, RT-PCR. And essentially it is a swab test. Uh, the swab is normally taken from the nasal passage, ideally from the nasal pharynx, because that is the area that has the highest concentration of viral uh, virus there. Uh, there are, however, newer tests which uh, advocate that they have high efficiency with uh, swabs taken from the nostril or in fact the saliva, saliva samples. And the collection technique is important. Obviously, the, the efficacy and the uh, sensitivity of the test is going to depend on the presence of viral particles. And so therefore, personnel who do these tests need to be adequately trained. And in general, as I said, most of these um, molecular tests can be completed within a few hours, or at most, depending on the center and the resources available, a few days. Now, the RT-PCR test, it's important for us to understand the difference between sensitivity and specificity of a test. The sensitivity is really the ability of the test to correctly identify those who have the disease. In other words, we're looking for positive patients. Whereas the specificity is the ability of the test to correctly identify those without the test. In other words, there is no vir virus present. Now, a positive test that comes back on a PCR, what does it tell you? Well, it tells you almost, uh, almost conclusively that the patient has COVID-19 infection. However, there is some cross uh, sensitivity of the test and it could be uh, on a rare occasion a bacterial or other viral infection. However, the, the negative test, if we receive a negative uh, PCR test, does that mean that the patient is truly uh, COVID negative? Uh, it is in fact open to uh, error up to 30% of negative tests may be in incorrect in fact. And these are mainly because of a low level of virus present in the collection sample. Um, uh, two recent studies out of Cleveland Clinic and the New York University both questioned the accuracy of the more rapid tests and rather suggested that institutions that are doing major surgery should use the, the, the con con conventional tests. Now, um, the serological test is actually looking for, is a blood test looking for antibodies. It initially was not authorized by the Food and Drug Administration, but with the proliferation of PCR tests and confusion about them, the FDA did then allow them. And what we're looking for is in fact, a presence of antibodies in the blood sample. And these may either, either be IgM early phase or IgG later phase antibodies. And it's unclear at this stage whether the presence of antibodies, which would indicate prior infection, confers lasting immunity on our patients. Next slide. So the tests, the serological tests are a number of four, four they're four main types. Uh, they vary from those that are done on quite rapid basis between 10 and 30 minutes or an hour, like the rapid diagnostic test or the chemiluminescent immunoassay. Uh, they're basically looking for the presence or absence on a quantitative basis or qualitative basis of antibodies against the virus. But the downfall of these tests is they do not tell us the amount of antibodies the patient has in the serum, or more importantly, whether these antibodies are able to inhibit virus growth. The more conventional tests like the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, known commonly as the ELISA, or the neutralization assay are more uh, specific, and they also look for the presence or absence of virus particles, but in turn, they are able to tell us uh, particularly the neutralization assay, which is a three to five day test that can tell us whether the antibody is in fact able to inhibit virus growth, which is very important in terms of immunity. Next slide. Yep. So the limitations of the COVID test, if we test patients, what are the limitations? Well, the PCR is highly specific. Important that the collection site is optimal. That's a nasopharynx or in case, patients who may occasionally have a tracheostomy, you can use a bronchi alveolar lavage. Uh, an infected asymptomatic patient may in fact come up as a negative test and we have to be very wary of those. 
And as well, those patients that have infection and the symptoms are now waning and the viral load is decreasing may also come with a negative test. The IgM test, on the other hand, it takes 11 to 24 days before the antibodies appear in the serum. So it's more of a retrospective view of the patient and tells us whether in fact the patient has had an active infection in, in, in previous times, whereas the PCR test is a point of time test. Next slide. Howard, thank you very much for taking us through those tests. But I believe there are many centers do CT, uh, CT test as well. And there are other tests, such as the stool test or blood test, to be done. Would you like to throw some light on those tests, please? Yes. Well, the CT scan is essentially looking for ground glass uh, pathological changes in the pulmonary uh, architecture. And that sort of test that is routinely done, particularly for eye surgery. It may be done on a very rare occasion. There has been a cabal of case reports of patients who are presented with conjunctivitis with no symptomatology, and the only evidence of active COVID infection, in fact, was seen on the CT of the chest. So a CT test is really a last resort to exclude COVID in, in the very rare patient who may have a suspected uh, symptomatology. Uh, stool and urine testing, the virus may appear in the stool or the urine, but that's on a variable basis. Um, and not a consistent finding. So it's not a test that um, I would recommend routinely for our patients. I think that the PCR test is probably the uh, gold standard for testing our patients preoperatively. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Howard. Uh, can I ask at this stage, any panel member would like to ask any question to Howard? Okay. If nobody is asking question, we can, we can ask later on as well, if we have time. So now I would like to pass over my okay. uh, microphone to my colleague that way to Dr. Jai. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Chandra. Now moving on to the next very important topic, operation theater requirements and precautions to be taken up. So we will move on to Dr. Raja from LVPI. Dr. Raja, can you please highlight us about the theater modifications in the COVID situations in your OT? Thank you, Dr. Jay and Dr. Chandra for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this World Congress of Ophthalmic Anesthesia. To start with the uh, changes what we brought about in the, uh, this COVID period, I, I should start right from the entry into the OR to prepare ourselves. Uh, in, when the uh, people are entering into the OR, they're maintaining social distance even in the changing room. Uh, as much as possible. And then they wear the OR dress, the, uh, the cap, the N95 mask, the head shield, the shoe covers. They wash their hands with soap and water for 20 seconds and apply uh, what you call sterilium hand rub. And then they wear two pairs of gloves. That is the self-preparation what they make when they enter into the OR. Now coming into the, uh, the OR preparation, it's like routine checking the gas connections, the power supply, the uh, equipment uh, needed for intubation, all those things. But the additional two things, what uh, uh, what we are uh, keeping now at this COVID period is one is the, can you change the slide? The, the what we need is the, uh, what you call aerosol box and the plastic cover sheet. These are the two uh, equipment which we now, in this COVID period, we are putting it in our, uh, OR and keeping everything ready. Apart from the technician, we make the uh, uh, nurse also to keep all the things ready in the OR. Now coming to the uh, next is the pre-op area where the uh, anesthesia, uh, cons the technician will ask the surgeon and then bring the patient to the OR. So when he goes to the patient, he wears the head shield and gown before going to the patient, identify the patient and then uh, he checks the eye, ba eye uh, ch correct eye is uh, banded. Then he takes the consent. Well, coming to the consent, apart from the surgical consent, routinely we are also taking consent for uh, COVID. But as recently from the last one week, the uh, court of law in uh, uh, India, it has said that the consent which is taken for the uh, COVID in the COVID period is not that much valid. So, but still we are taking the COVID consent for each and every patient who come for the uh, surgery. Investigation point of view, we check all the routine investigations. And additionally, as the, as he was telling, the C, uh, we CT lung, we are not doing. HRCT, we are not doing. For asymptomatic patient, we are doing a plain X-ray chest. 
and we say that that the x-ray chest has to be read by a radiologist it's not because it is seen that in uh, some cases there are nodules which may, may not be well recognized by the uh, other than the radiologist so we, re we request the radiologist to uh, read the x-ray chest so uh, x-ray chest is mandatory for all the patients who are coming for ga uh, patients for local anesthesia patient we are not taking the x-ray chest then coming to the shifting bring the patient to the or the next slide so once we bring the patient to the or in coordinating the surgeon and all then we what we do is that the when the uh, when the patient enters into the uh, is brought into the or only three people are allowed into the or and we switch off the acs the patient is made lie on the or table then a aerosol box is kept the monitors are attached our monitors and the ventilators are completely Uh, covered with the uh, uh, transparent plastic sheets so that the regular touch is, uh, we will be regularly touching it that's the reason why we covered the monitors and the uh, our all ventilators and all so after making the patient lie down the uh, monitors are kept iv cannulation is kept pre medication glycoparlate is uh, normally given to reduce the secretions the induction is in routinely we give is the um, propofol and all and uh, pre oxygenation is done with the under the aerosol box and to the uh, mask we attach the um, what we call is a filter hme filter to the mask and other filter is also attached at the expiratory limb and it's given by the closed circuit no open circuit is not used it's given by the closed circuit so pre oxygenation is given induction agent is given analgesic is routinely the uh, fentanyl uh, fentanyl tramadol and butron is given when come to the muscle relaxant Uh, we, previously, we used to use atracurium, but now we have switched on to rocuron, and because of the uh, early onset of action within 30 seconds, scolin is also there. But very rarely we use scolin because scolin also increases the intraocular pressure. So mostly we are using the muscle relaxer rocuron. Once this is given, rapid sequence induction is done, and then uh, endotracheal uh, uh, endotracheal tube is uh, uh, put into the trachea, and first the cuff is inflated. and then a uh, what you call a filter is kept and then attached to the ventilator okay. once it attached to the ventilator meanwhile when we are doing this induction only three people are there anesthetist anesthesia technician and a nurse and one runner is there with where she waiting outside the or and she will be watching through the glass and if anything is necessary we we ask them ask them her to or him to uh, uh, for for help so only three people are there and after this uh, after the we put the endotracheal tube and everything is over we call the surgeon and the scrub nurse so that after 10 minutes of this uh, uh, induction and all they enter into the or so once the surgery is over again coming to the uh, extubation it is similar but like in the intraoperative period there is nothing much given but normally some of our anesthetists are practicing giving dexmethorphan because it reduces the post uh, post op uh, um, cough and all so they are practicing very low doses of dexmed are given to the patient in the intraoperative and apart from that the ondan citron all those drugs are given and once coming to the extubation before extubation they give, they just uh, give the reversal and then they uh, extubate once the patient is completely recovered they extubate the patient and then they transfer the patient to the uh recovery ward so the thing once they transfer the patient to the recovery ward what to the what the what we do is the i was talking about the hme filter the one filter is kept at the uh, endotracheal tube the other filters are kept at the expiratory limb and the inspiratory limb normally some uh, some of the people they are using two Uh, filters at the ex one in the expiratory limb, other in the inspiratory limb, under the endotracheal tube. But we are using one filter at the endotracheal tube and the other filter at the expiratory limb. And we, after the sur after the surgery is over, after the patient is moved, we throw both the filters, the filter which is there at the endotracheal tube and the filter which is there at the expiratory limb. And other things, all the things that have to be. Uh, most of the thing the th other things which we throw is the endotracheal tube the suction uh, uh, suction catheter and all will be disposed of Thanks. so the other things which we uh, what we do is we normally we do uh, two or three cases but the, uh, after after uh, at the end of the day we change the soda line for every case we are not changing the 
a soda line for the patients. Coming to the, our theater, as you know, as our theaters are all uh, ophthalmic, uh, uh, can you go back? So uh, we ophthalmic theaters. So we have positive pressure uh, system and the air exchanges, what we have here is 15 to 18 per hour. So what we do, we recommend the surgeon to take the case after 20 minutes. After everything is over, after the patient is shifted to the recovery ward and all, they clean, they scrub the theater, and then they close it. And after 20 minutes, the next case is taken. So this is a normal in general anesthesia, what uh, the system we have followed. So there are some of the changes which we have followed in the general anesthesia. Coming to the local anesthesia, in our institute, we are giving the block at the pre-op area. Uh, and that block is given, also given by an expert uh, like a, uh, an, uh, like a um, senior ophthalmologist or a senior anesthetist because too much of poking is also not advisable. And the what you call the monitor is also covered with a plastic sheet and then the block is given. After the block is given, the uh, technician shifts the patient to the OR. So this is the uh, system what we are calling for the local anesthesia. There's not much difference in the, in the local anesthesia, but some of the hospitals or some of the institutes I saw that they are doing it in the general anesthesia. They are giving the block in the uh, yeah. main OR itself. Thank you, Dr. Raja. Thank you. Now, moving on to Professor Chandra. Are there any recommendations in anesthesia literature on prevention, transfer and theater requirements for COVID patients? Yes, yes, Jai. Um, uh, as you would know that there are three main stakeholders for the operating theater. That's the surgeon number one, anesthetist number two, and the nurses. That's a three main. There are other stakeholders. Now, everybody is trying to focus on their own part. So the surgeon will focus on their part, and nurses will focus on their part, but anesthetists will focus on their part. And I can tell you this is a very, very good paper published in British Journal of Anesthesia, which goes through most of the things what Raja was saying. So I will highly recommend to you that to read this paper in the BJA, which had just been published about a couple of weeks ago, uh, and it goes on to say how to prepare the patient and how pre procedure room should be prepared. Then they also talk about the minimization of the aerosol generation, which is very important for any suspect cases. Then they talk about the uh, further recommendations for minimization of the aerosol. So these, these are the articles which would relate to you more than the surgeon, because this is, these are written for anesthetic consumption. So now I think that's what I had to say, Jai. Okay. Now one more question left to Dr. Alfred. Now, can you tell us what is the change over time between cases followed in Australia and for COVID theaters? Change over time. Okay. Dr. Alfred. In, thank you. In Australia or in my institution, it's approximately two hours. Now, it sounds very long. We wake up for the patient in the theater. Um, and after the patient is left the theater, we still have to retrospectively write up all the record chart all the medication, post-op instruction, et cetera. Theater got terminally cleaned up by the cleaners. We don't clean it. Uh, and the setting machine got wiped down and circuits got changed, including the solder line. Um, we treat confirmed and suspected case identical. And all the staff, or at least as far as I know, the anesthetic staff, they all have a shower between cases. No one want to pick up the disease and no one want to take them home. And because we don't have a lot of cases in Australia, um, our change over time is two hours roughly. I work in an institution that have 23 theaters. So if it comes to the push, I'm sure the time can be shortened or we can use another theaters. Okay, thank you, Dr. Alfred. Now moving on to the next uh, thing, precautions to be taken up. Dr. Mukta, can you suggest how to avoid and minimize exposure from COVID-19 patients? Which OR personnel needs N95 mask or advanced PPE? Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Jay. So as uh, you know, OER mentioned that uh, the best thing is to stop all elective surgeries. And as I said, that the, no, the test is available. When the test wasn't available, so you have, we had divided uh, I can tell you my personal experience at the national level here that we divide the COVID positive and COVID active theaters. 
and both even COVID positive or suspected COVID, you know, and preferably COVID screening for all urgent cases uh, in these days. But at that time, it was very limited because for emergency cases, it takes about two days before the results can come. And if the community spread of COVID-19 uh, COVID is significant, then all cases must be considered as they presume to be COVID positive. And emergency cases with full PPE, and especially anesthesiologists, uh, anesthetic nurses, and surgeons. Uh, in Ireland, what we do is that the patient comes into the theater, only two people are allowed, the consultant uh, anesthetist as well as the anesthetic nurse, which has a full PPE. Once the patient is intubated and secured the airway, then the surgeons and other uh, staff can be allowed to come into the theater. And Pre-op questionnaire, we established a pre-op question which can identify the risk as exposure. And also, it gives the help for the history regarding the self-isolation and the cocooning. But the social distance is very important at work and as well as, you know, in the, in, in the ward and in the theater, which can minimize. Okay. Thank you. Now, Dr. Alfred, does proper PPE protect the healthcare worker against COVID? Um, obviously, there's no uh, direct control trial um, that allow you to compare. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, thank you. Um, but there's some indirect evidence. If you look at the SARS, the Toronto group showed that if you have unprotected eye contact with the SARS equation, you've got an odd ratio of uh, seven times to pick up the disease. And equally again in SARS in Hong Kong, when they did the retrospective analysis, every single infected healthcare worker had reported PPE breach. None of them that have no reported breach have picked up any infection. The third evidence come from the COVID case death in UK. Um, Cook published the paper recently in April among all the death-related healthcare workers, there's no anesthetic or intensive care staff. I think together they give you some indirect evidence to support that properly where the PPE are sufficient protection. Okay, thank you. Now, one more question to you. What type and size of face mask should the staff use? Tell us about a proper mask fitting test, face mask testing technique when applying the mask during each clinical use, Dr. Alfred. Okay, can I have the slide, please? Now, when you're looking at the face mask, there's actually two tests you should do. The first one is a quantitative fitting test. It, you use a machine, take about 15, 20 minutes to do. They actually measure the actual amount of leakage. It will allow you to know the exact brand, exact sizing of the mask you should use. Each time you, you wear the mask, you should do a seal check test. It's a quick test to see that whether the masks are sealed up properly to do that. Next slide. If you look at the New South Wales um, health guideline for face masks, they separate the, on the left-hand side droplets precaution and the right-hand side airborne precaution. The droplets precaution, they actually include severe coughing and chest compression and defibrillation during CPR. For that, they recommend surgical masks and you can wait up to about four hours. For airborne precaution, they include intubation, high flow nasal oxygen, manual or non-invasive ventilation, you should use N95 masks. And you can wait, wait up to about eight hours and you should replace it when it's a soil or moist. In practice, all of us that are deal with, uh, in Australia anyway, that deal with uh, confirmed or suspected COVID case, we all wear N95. We don't have a shortage and we actually wear as much protection as we can. Okay, thank you. Now, two more opinions we would like, I would like to want from you. Is the plastic intubation box useful in COVID intubation or the, whether the, you would like to know the, whether the clear plastic sheet covering the patient's head during COVID intubation is useful? Okay, can you, can you keep the next slide, please? Now, the aerosol box or the plastic box was designed by a Taiwanese uh, anesthetist. There's some, next slide, please. 
there's the original design which basically have uh, the holes for the hand to go in. And there's a later design which incorporated either some plastic or uh, rubber things to get a better seal on those holes. The Melbourne group put the aerosol box early generation and the latest uh, model into a simulator test. All the participants are experienced and needed this at least seven to 23 years post uh, graduation. Um, what they find was the intubation time from the time they took off the mask to the time they put the uh, intubate at uh, the endotracheal tube first breath confirmed it with no aerosol boss, everything is under a minute. It's 42.9 seconds. With the early generation, there's 82 seconds. And the latest model is a little bit better. But if you look at the range, some of them go over two minutes. In a COVID case, that can be quite hypoxic after 60 seconds. Again, you look at the first pass success, with the aerosol box that's lesser, without the box is 100%. Uh, PPE bridge on the last column, the latest model with the rubber thing quite often actually take the glove off your um, gun, uh, 58%. So overall, their suggestion is that intubation box are not particularly useful or safe for the healthcare worker, unless you're extremely familiar with it. Next slide, please. In terms of the plastic cover sheet, there's nothing um, experimental or simulation that people have done on it. I have tried it myself. Extubation are fantastic. You can pull everything out, wrap everything and throw it away. I find it excellent. Intubation, I find it troublesome. I practice it on non-COVID patients. The plastic drip, unfortunately, constantly floating down and cover me whenever I actually want the room to maneuver to put the tube in. I personally don't find it particularly useful and find it troublesome. Other may have a different opinion on it. Thank you, Dr. Arthur. That was a very interesting information to share between a food box and plastic sheet. Now we'd like to hear from Professor Palte. What is your views about protection and face mask? Thank you, Jai. Um, well, you, protection is important because who are we trying to protect? We really have to protect the healthcare personnel because healthcare personnel are at risk. Can we go back one slide? Um, Want to change? Yeah, next slide. One slide. Next slide. Okay, so the coronavirus is spread by contact or droplet transmission. And the personal protective equipment is one component that we use to protect staff and other personnel in the OR. And it's important that we use appropriate PPE. A, it decreases the risk of viral transmission and ultimately the decreases the risk of infection. And uh, healthcare personnel, particularly anesthesiologists and ophthalmologists are at particular uh, susceptibility for acquiring COVID infection. I'll allude to that a little bit later. So what we need to do is to match the PPE that we use to the mode of transmission. Are we gonna have a viral droplet uh, contact or are we gonna have direct contact with the patient? Uh, remembering that overuse of PPE is, uh, leads to depletion of stock and is actually abuse. Next slide, please. So there are three main modes of viral transmission. Contact uh, precautions should be taken when the patient is more than two to three meters away from you and in that case, it's adequate just to use gloves and an apron. However, when we are going to be exposed to droplets, in other words, we were within two meters of the patient, then it's appropriate to use gloves and apron, uh, a fluid resistant uh, surgical mask, such as an N95, and particularly for uh, ophthalmologists and anesthesiologists or healthcare providers uh, providing anesthesia to eye patients, we definitely need to use eye protection in the form most likely of a face visor. Uh, for aerial generating procedures, such as during intubation or extubation, then our PPE that is appropriate is more extensive. In addition to what we do for droplet precautions, we also need to uh, have more extensive uh, gowning, especially gowning that protects the arms all the way up beyond the elbow. Next slide. So this is an interesting study and it just alludes and highlights how susceptible we as healthcare personnel 
are to this uh, viral, viral um, onslaught. Razana et al. in a, a study that was conducted in April last month that is yet to be published, did a survey in the New York area of 340 residency programs. And they wanted to see what the risk of exposure for residents in different specialities who dealt with COVID-19 patients. They sent the survey to 340 residency uh, programs that covered a multiple uh, disciplines. They had responses from 91 of these residencies and they got uh, details on 2,300 odd uh, residents. What was interesting was that 45% of the programs reported that they had at least one resident who was COVID-19 positive. Um, what is also important to know in this study was that of the residents that were surveyed, 82% of them used a 90, N95 mask according to the context in which they were dealing with patients. And 6% of the, res the residents used a N95 mask all the time, no matter what the case was. Um, they then assayed which, page, which residents had um, COVID-19 infection according to three criteria. Uh, either they were COVID positive on PCR testing and had symptoms in which there was no doubt about the infection. They had a second group who they presumed had uh, COVID-19 infection who actually had marked symptoms, but they were still awaiting results of COVID-19 testing. And then they had a third group who they said were suspected of having the infection because of their symptomatology. Next slide. What emerged from this study was that there were three predominantly resident groups who were at higher risk. Those three groups were anesthesiology, emergency medicine, and ophthalmology. And what is interesting to note is that in those groups of the anesthesiology residents, 8% of them converted to be COVID-19 positive. In the emergency uh, residents, it was 7%. And among ophthalmology residents, it was 5.5%. So the underlying score and under, and underlying message that we receive here is that we as healthcare providers for eye care surgery need to be particularly vigilant about using our PPE in an appropriate and expeditious manner and being very aware that we are at the, probably the highest risk of all the medical sub-disciplines of acquiring this infection. Thank you. Ben? Practical considerations, if I may just go back one slide. Back one slide, please. One, one slide back, thank yeah. you. We should avoid airway uh, instrumentation wherever possible because these are aerosol generating procedures. Uh, also, we don't want coughing of the patient. Uh, regional anesthesia should be our choice, obviously as far as possible because we decrease our post-operative pain, we decrease opioid consumption. We reduce the risk for nausea and vomiting, which are also uh, expose us to viral particles. And we preserve respiratory function, particularly in those patients who may have some respiratory compromise that is not yet clinically evident. So as far as possible, we should use appropriate PPE and aim to do most of our anesthesia uh, practices under regional block or topical. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Palte. That was an interesting survey results which shows that both ophthalmologists and anesthesiologists are the most vulnerable groups. And that is the reason why we are actually met here. Thank you. That was a very, informa very informative now. Now, Chandra, I don't think so. We have enough time to have the panelists to have any extra comments. We will directly move on to the next we'll topic. Take the comments later on. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Jai. Now we come to the choice of anesthesia. Of course, we have been talking about it, that the general anesthesia is disastrous. Whatever can happen, it can aerosol generate, generating and whatnot. But when you do ask for the local anesthesia or general regional anesthesia, we need to ask, what is, why, why regional anesthesia? So the first question is to Dr. Mukta. Tell us why you prefer regional anesthesia and why, you know, yeah. Dr. Mukta. Uh, thanks, Chandra. And so when this comes to the general uh, regional, and I will say strongly in, in our institution, and that's the consensus overall in the international as well, that the we should use the regional as much as possible. And regional should be done by the senior person and expert person. So there's no need to convert into the GA or this inadequate block, uh, which can cause problems. So uh, if the volume and block, whatever you choose it, is uh, enough volume to get to the you know good block, and that the uh, use type of local anesthesia, you have to use the long acting uh, local anesthetics. So that will be 
enough for the length of the surgery and in this case i think every case should be discussed with the with the surgeon that uh, how uh, like a cataract is a cataract but it can be difficult cataract or vitrectomy can be long vitrectomy or short vitrectomy so it's a good communication good planning and uh, block should be uh, i prefer uh, subtinon and most of them that if you have to top it up you can top it up intraoperatively if you need it but so far in last three months thank god we don't need to do it and uh, we have done loads of uh, cases long cases under regional patient should wear the mask from the ward to the ot and continue during the regional block and if the patient is uh, copd oxygen dependent and the best recommendation will be use the uh, nasal prongs under the mask with a low flow and try to avoid the free flow oxygen which can generate aerosol and can cause problem in case the general anesthesia has to be planned then patient should be extubated in the theater we already you know mentioned a lot of people donning and doffing should be done in such a way donning should be done outside all the pp should be weared and doffing after the given the ga patient should be extubated preferably in the theater and then doffing should be done in the theater then recovery staff should come and collect the patient so it means you are not taking all the pp and contaminating other area so regional cases preferably should be transferred back to the ward to minimize exposure uh, to the other staff preferably so far we discussed using the lma we were not using the lma again it can cause uh, aerosol uh, so we pre oxygenate for 5 minutes intubated without bag and mask and is called modified induction technique if need use a small tidal volume in case patient desaturate or which need to be and as uh, my other colleague mentioned that we cough up before do the bag and mask or pulse repressor ventilation thank you thanks sandra now, my next question is to uh, dr alfred chua what is your preference for anesthesia and why is there any preference for a particular type of eye block whether you go for subtenon a needle block or whatever i think mukhtar did say his preference but what's your opinion uh, without a doubt uh, regional anesthesia is preferred over general anesthetic intubation alone manipulating the air will increase the risk of uh, transmission to healthcare work about 6.6 .6 times during the SARS so i think in the same principle we should avoid manipulating or dealing with the airway so regional should be preferred then it come to the situation if the patient is maybe maybe not you're not 100% confident whether regional or general anesthesia is appropriate to the patient I personally would choose general anesthesia. I think if the regional case halfway through you have to convert into a general it's very messy. You may so well do it properly right from the beginning. That's my opinion. Okay. What about in, the in terms of the block um in the covid positive patient 5% of them have positive conjunctival swab. So on that basis, you can argue a needle place box such as peripheral block are, are better over subtenon. The other side of the coin is if you give them five percent profitable out that antiseptic for three minutes, they would have killed the virus. Therefore, should subtenon be just equally effective? Is the anti septic sufficient to get into conjunctival sac and also kill the virus in there i'm not 100% sure i think it really will be up to the discretion of the team personally i think it's slightly favor a needle block the reason is uh, they are said what what uh, alfred is saying is why should you choose that and he's giving the reason these are the two papers in the literature one is saying the patient suffers from conjunctivitis and the other one is that actually the virus is found on to the the um, cornea the conjunctival surface so obviously when you do the the anesthesia topical anesthesia would be probably uh, uh, needed if you can get the operation done with that but if you do have to do it perhaps the percutaneous peribulbar might be the best option under the circumstances 
So I've got another question for you, Alfred. How, uh, is there any difference in PPE during the RA? Um, I can have the slide, please. Now, I personally think they should be the same on both. What you don't want is you do a particular type of PPE for regional and halfway, unfortunate, you need to convert and it's a messy situation and you are not up to the standard to conversion into a general anesthesia. So I think you should wear sufficient so that you can do a general anesthesia. Now the face mask, supposedly for regional anesthesia, you can use a surgical face mask. In the practice here, we just wear N95 for all the suspected or confirmed uh, COVID cases. Right, so I've got another question for you, uh, Alfred. How do you use supplementary oxygen and capnography during RA? And if you do, how do you minimize contamination of the capnography instrument? Okay, can I have the slide, please? Now, I put a surgical face mask on the patient and then on top of that, I use a cut off uh, uh, oxygen mask. N95 masks are quite uncomfortable to breathe through and patient under the dread may not be comfortable breathing through that. So I use a surgical mask and on top of that, we put a uh, big dread over it. Uh, next slide for the capnography. For the capnography, looking at the left hand side, if you use a three millimeter endotracheal tube mark and you use a pediatric filter and put it together and you can just gently push it through one of those holes in the side of the uh, Hassan mask or oxygen mask. And if you connect it into it, it doesn't give you a perfect capnography tracing. You can see the bottom uh, tracing on the right hand side of the picture. It gives you a CO, entitled CO2 roughly about 10. It will give you a pattern but it's not perfect. We'll give you some ideas. Um, we also, next slide please. We also put a um, suctioning device there so that we can improve the airflow. And we use an adult filter, uh, depends on the size of your suction tubing. Uh, on the one that I choose, a eight millimeter endotracheal tube mount will just fit into the yellow part of it. If you connect it together, you will get, have a suction thing and we put it close to the chest on the patient and it will provide oxygen in and gear flow to come out without the CO2 building up underneath the drain. Thank you. Now, in terms of wearing face masks, is it effective? If you look at the normal cough, coughing on the right-hand side, the red color one, if you don't wear any mask, it will pull, uh, disperse up to about 68 centimeter anterior in front of it. As you wear the mask, it becomes 30 in a surgical mask and N95 down to 15 centimeter. On the right hand side of it, once you put a mask on, instead of going forward, they actually start coming out from to the side. So standing next to the patient, your assistant may be just dangerous to them. So I think all the staff should wear sufficient protection. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very helpful, Alfred. Now Thank I you. have got um, moving on to Jai. Jai, are you ready? Yeah. Uh, uh, Jai and Kali have devised a new circuit for delivering oxygen to patient undergoing regional anesthesia for eye surgery. Can you describe your technique, please, Jai? Yeah, it is almost similar to Dr. Alfred mentioned. Can I, yeah, it is almost similar, but just we are trying to modify it and trying on patients right now. So what is the disadvantage is the surgical mask, which is generally recommended for regional ophthalmic anesthesia is that the surgical drapes might press on the mask to the patient nostrils. Suppose the patient coughs, sneezes, the mask can get wet. This can in turn lead to discomfort to the patient and suddenly there is chances of untoward head movement. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So this is the recommendation by joint statement by American Society of Regional Anesthesia, Pain and Medicine and European Society of Regional Anesthesia, where they say that if the patient needs supplement oxygen, an oxygen mask should be preferred over the nasal prongs. And they also say that flow of supplemental oxygen should be maintained 
and the surgical mask can be used over the oxygen mask to limit the dispersion can you show the next slide yeah this is a video can you play on the video yeah so th this is the double limb circuit which i'm trying to use now it's a much closer view where we can see it is built using a y shaped connector it has two unidirectional flow valves now one connected to the inspiratory limb where the oxygen from the machine comes to the patient now the, through the aerosol mask the patient breathes and the exhaled air moves to the other limb that is the expiratory limb here again i have attached one more unidirectional flow valve in the reverse direction and from there it goes to the corrugated tube also if the air goes to the inspiratory limb it gets redirected and then it goes towards the expiratory limb here now to confirm this in the expiratory limb just before that unidirectional valve i have put an end tidal carbon dioxide monitoring also now we can very well appreciate the monitor that the etco2 is well within the normal limits here yeah and the patient is also very much comfortable and the expired air from the corrugated tube is then passed is then entered outside the operation theater this is how it is entered out so can you move on to the next slide so some of the advantages of this uh, so called double limb circuit which i am trying to use is that for the patient it is quite comfortable as the surgical drape is away from the nostrils patients receive oxygen through via the aerosol mask and there is no entrance to the surgical field also for the anesthetist it is quite easy to set up and etco2 is constantly monitored and for the theater staff it avoids theater contamination so i am trying to use this type of circuit thank you professor chandra thank you thank you very much jai now i move on to dr, dr. chandra dr hmm. chandra can i ask one question uh, which maybe no, no, for... just, just just wait for a minute the we will ask the question to the end yeah sorry raja but okay. is it a quick question Is it a quick? Uh, is it a fast? Is it a fast question to Dr. Mukta? Okay, go on, you, go on, ask to the guy. Yeah, he, he was telling that LMA uh, is avoided uh, uh, to this patient, but I feel that if you put an LMA and pack it, inflate it nicely, and put it in a closed circuit, will it be of any use, Dr. Mukta? Uh, thanks for asking. Oh, and I'll ask it to Dr. Mukta. Uh, can you be Can you be short, Mukta, please? Because uh, I, I will be very short. You know and. LMA. If the patient is now, we are changing our practice because every general anesthesia patient has a fast uh, COVID test done, and the COVID result will be back within two hours. And but in the beginning, when the pandemic started, when there was no COVID test done, and then we have a huge exposure where the staff has to get isolation and 14 days because they're due to contact and all those things, and the patient was not, you know, self isolation and cocooning. at that time we were not using the lma i hope i answer the question yeah yeah thank you okay. okay so the next question is to um, to dr tom ek has the actual practice of local anesthetic for eye surgery changed because of the covid has your unit taken any different approach to the eye anesthesia because of covid and um, aerosol generating procedure uh, issues uh, tom Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, well, obviously, we, we we're trying to avoid operating on anybody we know to have COVID. Um, or, there's a lot of surgical planning to be done, and actually, we're now having to telephone the patients beforehand um, because, of course, many patients will decide they don't want to come in for their semi-urgent operation because they'd rather have their eye get a bit worse than catch COVID. So the ones who do want to come, uh, the current rule this week where I work is that the patients should be, have all been self-isolated for 14 days prior to surgery, but they come out of isolation just to be taken to the COVID swab place, which involves a car journey. Um, our local anaesthetic techniques haven't actually changed. Uh, we're continuing to do subtenon for retina. Uh, subtenon can, of course, be uh, topped up by the surgeon if it's a long operation, and it seems that with the um, Uh, Povid and iodine first. That should be a low risk procedure. Um, plus, of course, most of us in the UK have become de-skilled with our needle blocks, um, and we continue to use almost no sedation. And as others have said, you know, um, general anaesthesia is preferably avoided because of all of the um, 
uh, aerosol generating and, all, and cleaning and all those things. So, so, so that's the situation in the UK this week. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Now I have got a question for Dr. Ravi. I believe there is some hesitancy in India amongst the ophthalmologists to perform procedures under GA. Can you tell us something more about it, Dr. Ravi? Yeah, initially there is a hesitancy because everybody faced this year, shock state of the initial phase of lockdown. As the time is the best healer. As the days advances, they get a lot of correct and incorrect information through the media and also information with others. So they convince and some of the surgeries which can be done, especially in the pediatric age group, they have to do under general anesthesia. And the proper PPE, so many people have mentioned about the size of the mask, proper PPE, and so many techniques. They observed how we perform the anesthesia. They gain confidence and they convince. Now slowly they started accepting and they started doing the procedure, especially when the time is given for 20 minutes off time, they feel they are very, very much confident there is no aerosol in the room. So, so, But one problem is they find it very difficult as with the complete PPE, with the face code and everything. I think in general anesthesia, they will be a little more uh, tense when doing the procedures. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Rabi. Now, I come back to you, Jai. Yeah. that you have developed an interesting new barrier technique for anesthesia administration for needle block in this COVID scenario, uh, which is going to be published soon. Yeah. Could you tell us more about it, please, Jai? Yeah, the slides, please. See, actually, the literature review shows that needle block per se or the needle block associated with sedations can result in vigorous and continuous sneezing. Also, next slide. There is an interesting syndrome called as Achu syndrome, which is reported in approximately 25% of the population where the sneezing is provoked upon exposure to bright light. So in the present COVID situation, if such complications are expected to occur, then I suggest a simple extra barrier technique. Next slide. So this is our indigenous aerosol box. Yes, next slide. So what I was trying to do is that we can just keep the aerosol box around the patient. It is very important to inform the patient the importance of keeping this box. It prevents the transmission of virus either from the doctor to the patient or from the patient to the doctor also. Then for performing the inferior lateral injection, we can stand at the side hand and one hand can be passed through the front side of the box while the other hand can be passed through the side, of, side hole of the box. Now, while performing the medial peribulbar injection, you can come to the head end and you can very well perform it by passing the two hands through the two holes which are at the head end. Next slide. So the aerosol box just acts as an extra barrier to prevent contact and or aerosol transmission of virus from patients during administration of needle box for eye surgery, especially in those with allergic cough, photoic sneeze and those receiving IV sedations and also in patients with chronic hyperactive airways, smokers, etc. And I'm glad to say that this article is getting published in the high journal in the next forthcoming issue. Congratulations, Jai. Thank I you. I think Thank we are you. running short of time now. We are getting very late. Uh, we still got to cover two more important topics. So now I'll pass my uh, uh, to, to, to Jai now. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Chandra. Now moving on to the next challenging topics, that is pediatric anesthesia. Professor Renu, are you there? Hi, Jay. Yeah. In the light of COVID infections, what changes in pediatric anesthesia have been made and yeah. adapted in your hospital? I will say that uh, there are multiple guidelines which are published for adult as well as for the pediatric anesthesia management. So this is the recent guideline which was published in Anesthesia and Analysia in April 2020. And the another guideline which was published in pediatric anesthesia regarding the COVID-19 anesthetic implication. So these are the guidelines which are published from UK and US. Uh, sir, next slide, please. Keep asking, yeah. Yeah. So uh, from the India, they have published from All India Ophthalmic Society regarding the ophthalmic practice guidelines in the current context in COVID-19. So this is the Indian guidelines which were taking care of anesthesia part also. So the next slide, please. 
so type of cases which which we are discussing about adult the same applies to the children also that malignancy side threatening cases emergency cases but one thing more because the children they cannot show you eye so the examination of the eye are done under anesthesia so these cases are also there once they want to see that whether perforation is there or not whether i need any surgery or not so these short examinations are also done in this time under general anesthesia next slide sir as everybody said that the uh, guidelines are changing every day so depending upon the current guidelines the one should think about using the policies for special investigations and other things icmr guidelines are also changing day by day so one should be aware and should do the things rightly according to the guidelines next slide sir sedation is very important for children as we cannot say them to stop crying so they cry because of hunger they cry because of the anxiety they cry because of the pain so pre medication is very important as we say that in the ot we need very less people so nowadays uh, parents are also not going inside the ot especially and the up uh, for the iv cannulation also to reduce the crying apart from amla we give the pre medication in the current scenario oral and intravenous pre medications are given no intranasal pre medication is advisable in the uh, covid time next slide sir What so is it is difficult to get surgical mask for the children so one should assure that the mask which is uh, put on the child is fitting so in the pediatric hospital they make those uh, mask rest of the uh, preparations are same as for the adult patients so i am not going in detail of the other ot preparations for the pediatric patient the next slide please sir regarding the anesthesia technique in pediatric patients as for the adult intravenous uh, anesthesia induction is preferred but sometimes it is difficult to put intravenous line and patient is crying so in those selected cases inhalational induction can be done but one should know as dr raja said that closed circuit should be used no open circuit should be considered until unless uh, otherwise indicated the deep profound neuromuscular blockers should be used for the rapid sequence induction and modified rapid sequence induction in adults they usually uh, survive for for the apnea time but in the pediatric patients many a times you need to ventilate the patient so the ventilation should be low tidal volume with minimal possible fresh gas flow you can ventilate patient with even 1 liter of the fresh gas flow so use that good mask seal should be there with the two hand technique especially in the pediatric patients is difficult sometimes to get the mask seal so one should use two hand technique next slide sir as i said that face mask ventilation should be minimal so if inhalational induction is done then only face mask ventilation should be done pre covid era we were doing examination under anesthesia with the face mask ventilation but in the current scenario it is not advisable in the pediatric age group also cupped endotracheal tube should be used and cuff should be inflated as soon as intubation is done i suggest to use micro cuff tube for the neonates and infants as uh, dr raja was asking about supraglottic device initially there was very much concern about the supraglottic device use but gradually gradually it is said that if there is only minimal leak then it is acceptable and it is good to use second generation supraglottic device because their seal is better intubation should be done by the experienced person video laryngoscope should be sir video laryngoscope should be used because it will maintain a greater distance between the patient and the performance jo laryngoscope is there are different guidelines for the difficult intubation i am not going in that detail one should use in line closed suction so that there will be no aerosol generation during the endotracheal tube suction Uh, these pictures were published in the anesthesia analgesia which was uh, uh, published recently they suggested that use plastic tent for the induction for video laryngoscopy and for the direct laryngoscopy also but one should be accustomed to use these plastic uh, tent uh, previously also otherwise sometimes it will be very difficult during the difficult intubation next slide sir next slide sir viral filter should be used in the anesthesia circuit sir back next time bye sir back 
ET tube should be confirmed by chest expansion, ETCO2 and ultrasound. It was suggested that no auscultation should be done. And if you want to see the leak, then ventilatory parameters on the anesthesia machine can be seen. Extubation, it is said that it should be done in deeper plane, but for the neonates and for the infant, sometimes it is difficult to extubate in deep plane. So one should uh, customize according to their expertise. To prevent cuffing and bucking, dexmetidomidine, lignocaine, and propofol can be used before extubation. The child should recover in the OR only so to, uh, to prevent the infection to the other health worker, and they should be shifted directly to the ward. You can put them in the incubator uh, for the oxygenation and for the to prevent the hypothermia. Next slide, sir. Next slide, sir. So viral filter can be put at different places. Uh, these pictures are also from the anesthesia analgesia. They have suggested that viral filter should be used just after the endotracheal tube once you are shifting the patient. But if you are using Mapleson D circuit in the neonate and infants, it should be put after the fresh gas flow because their dead space is too much, which can cause problem during the ventilation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reno. Now, for the benefit of the audience, actually, we are running uh, over time, but still, we will try to answer all the questions and I request the panelists to little bit shorten your comments also, so that that will be easy for the, for us to take the questions from the audience also. Okay. Now, Dr. Alfred, is there any difference between intubating methods on suspected COVID adults and children? Uh, can we Dr. put the slide on, please? Um, Obviously, they're similar. You use in the adult, you try to use a video laryngoscope, use a bougie, use the cup tube, and you keep your distance away from it. In the children, I find it very difficult to use a video laryngoscope. The, the face mask, the N95, all the extra gears, it start fogging up. It's very difficult to see. Inevitably, I end up have to put my face close and do it like the direct uh, method. Cupped endotracheal tubes are preferred. I always have an uncupped tube ready. And I have never tried it. I just wonder if I ever have to use an uncupped tube. Is there any place to put a flow pack in and therefore minimize the um, secretion aerosol coming out? I don't know. If you elected to use a scolene, succibethonium to intubate them, I think you should get the actual being ready in the children's group. Other than that, they're pretty similar. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alfred. I think uh, we'll move on to the next topic, Dr. Chandra. Okay, thank you very much, Jai. I apologize to the uh, Facebook and YouTube participants that we are running late, so very sorry, but we'll try to answer your question. We are going to cover the last part which is the important post-operative area. And I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Professor Howard Palte, what precautions are necessary in the post-operative period, especially in PACU? Can you be short, uh, Howard, please? Thank you, Chandra. Yes, I'll shorten my reply. So the post-operative period, the healthcare personnel, the OR personnel are still at high risk for exposure to the virus. You mustn't think because the surgery is over and uh, that the patient will no longer transmit the virus. Studies in China have shown that strict guide, control guidelines that are implemented will decrease infection and increase the overall well-being of healthcare personnel. And we remember we have shown that anesthesiologists and our uh, certified registered nurse anesthetists are also at risk of infection. Uh, for eye surgery, as we said, we much prefer local anesthetic or topical or regional anesthesia because we decrease the amount of the need for PACU or post anesthesia care. Uh, we need to limit sedation so we don't have respiratory compromise in the perioperative period. And what we ideally would like to do is discharge our patients directly to the floor from the operating room to decrease viral spread within our environment. Next slide. So for general anesthesia, the guidelines are that we should extubate our patients in the operating room. Prior to extubation, we should do adequate suctioning so that the impulse to cough and clear secretions is reduced. Um, we routinely, uh, if airway considerations taken into place allow, we would do a deep level of anesthesia extubation to obviously decrease cough and the potential for aerosol generation. And uh, if your facility would uh, permit, and it varies from situation uh, area to area, 
The ideal is to recover the patient in the operating room so that you can directly discharge them from there back to the floor. However, given economic consideration and turnover times, uh, many of our general anesthesia patients do end up going to the post-operative anesthesia care unit. Once they have arrived there, those personnel need to have adequate uh, PPE, uh, wear, use adequate PPE. We need to maintain social distancing and we need to uh, stress that hand hygiene, frequent and intermittent hand hygiene is an important component of prevention um, in this scenario. We avoid um, high flow oxygen apparatus, particularly in patients who may have obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, we uh, also have suction readily available we use low flow oxygen wherever possible. And of course, we make sure that our uh, anesthesia recovery staff do have eye protection because of the risk of coughing and secretions. Next slide. So the anesthesia, the, the journal anesthesia recently published a mnemonic for the management of airways in the COVID patients or potential COVID patients. And I think it's a very good mnemonic to remember that use SAS, be safe, make sure that the environment is safe for your staff and the patient. Be accurate. In other words, don't do unreliable techniques for intubation. Don't try to start new to try uh, attempt new techniques. Do things that work well and things you're familiar with. And be swift. I I intubate and extubate your patients in an expeditious manner without rush and bother. And rather, if it is a difficult airway, leave those uh, periods of the perioperative management to senior anesthesia personnel. Next slide. So the aerosol generating events that we would just think about in the PACU and the things that we really want to avoid are coughing, sneezing, and expectoration. We don't want to do positive pressure ventilation, particularly if we have an inadequate seal on the face mask. High flow nasal oxygen is a no-no. Um, it's advisable that we should avoid delivery using nebulizer atomized medications by a simple face mask because there will be a lateral spread of the viral particles into the atmosphere. Obviously, cardiopulmonary resuscitation is something that will rarely occur, but it is a time when there could be potentially viral transmission. And of course, tracheal intubation is a high-risk period, so we should perform that in the operating room with minimal personnel available, probably the anesthesiologist and assistant, maybe a floor nurse to be available to provide equipment or drugs that may be required, but certainly the surgeon and the surgical staff attendants should be out of the room at the time of extubation. Next slide. So on the, the last component of the post-operative care is the transport of the patient back to the, to, to the floor, to the ward. It's important that the patient at this stage still wears a face mask, they can still transmit virus. Or equally important is that the transporter has appropriate protective equipment. Uh, they should wear a face mask, have gloves, which should be changed between patients, and preferably wear a gown to prevent contamination of their surgical kit. Nurses obviously need PPE in the PACU, and the ideal is that in the, uh, on the ward, once a patient arrives back, each patient should have a separate room. That is practically often not uh, uh, acceptable or achievable um, goal. So what we recommend is that there's adequate uh, social spacing between patients. Uh, and also if we patients do require supplemental oxygen on the floor, that this is provided in a low flow uh, nasal cannula is used for that. Thank you very much, uh, Howard. Uh, uh, so that covers the post-operative. Now, while Dr. Sudeir and Dr. Jai are collecting yeah. all the questions from the from the delegates, just I've got two, three small floating questions we could not fit anywhere. And I'll just very quickly ask these three people very quick answer. Don't go into the much detail. First to Dr. Mukta, what is PODS, P-O-D-S? Uh, thanks, Chandra. Uh, what happened that the, we... In Ireland, uh, when the pandemic started, unfortunately, we got the exposure and a lot of hospitals, the people have to go into the self-isolation. The learning point was that we established a pod system. Pod system is, is, a, is a group of people you nominate and structure and divide into the groups and with a dedicated task with, a, you know, you call team, but the team is, is more than team. Uh, the best way they can't meet each other, the communication will be through the Zoom or WhatsApp group, and they have the dedicated task. The advantage of that one is that there is a group of four or five people that if any of them got symptomatic or any 
family member is got symptomatic or any family member travel abroad has a contact with them because now the self isolation cocooning and lockdown it it makes a huge difference but in the beginning it was a lot of hospital like 60 70% staff has to go to the self isolation so part system is where you can divide it's divided into the surgeons and anesthetists and from nursing point of view and especially as anesthetists is work very well uh, you give the bring the people because activity is decreased and a lot of people there is a question that people are not working as much as they have worked but that wasn't the issue is to protect the people and uh, safety so people come work two days then they will be three days not working there in case they get any of them get the symptomatic or anything they will be self isolated they will they will report to their uh, relevant uh, team member so basic rules are that there is no overlapping if anyone gets symptomatic they contact directly the you know with the line manager or and isolate and the team members there is another team which is for backup and in this pod system it gives the opportunity that uh, people uh, you know on not only the occupational health they can tell us they can tell us uh, if they have any medical condition or immunosuppressant or high risk uh, you know medical condition so from that point of view we can dedicate those people into those area where they have least contact with the with the covid or suspected covid patient for example pre op assessment or other thing establishing the guidelines and communication so that's briefly i can say about pod thank you, thank you very much mukhtar one brief question to dr tommy has covid caused you to change practice and which changes did you anticipate could become permanent since the covid threat has passed well, thanks Tom. yeah hi uh, thanks so well it's as we've all said it's all very fast moving and the guidance does seem to change from week to week and from country to country and even within the uk it's changing and different uh, but certainly uh, phoning the patient first um, really is helpful and uh, it's actually much better to to discuss things before the day of the operation anyway uh, plus also discussing the uh, the covid question having the patients arriving uh, at staggered intervals as has been previously suggested really helps with the efficiency and i i just like this viscoelastic on the cornea for the faker whether or not it's actually needed um hygiene wise we're going to be all be more hygienic those um breath guards on the slit lamp they're going to stay i think we're going to be washing our hands more and we're going to be using definitely single use things like eye drops so those are the main ones i think okay thank you thank you tom i will ask the last question to dr oya in your opinion what will stay permanent after covid dr oya thank you very much professor kumar um i think this period can be prolonged and more than expected and maybe it will be gone without a trace however in the perspective of related literature i think we will define a new standard for the preoperative period and uh, anything unless it is practical or a fair effort effect can stay permanent or widely accepted in this era it looks like uh, asking questions about covid contact and travel will be the routine as well as checking the sign and symptoms of uh, covid infection in the preoperative evaluation and in the intraoperative care i think we will check fever always and we will put surgical masks for the patients and we will always use an acceptable level of pp if there is a suspect or non suspect in non suspected cases and we will use less uh, rsl generating techniques for ophthalmic uh, procedures and anesthesiological techniques and we will avoid general anesthesia and we will go with uh, regional anesthesia more and for the post operative care i think we will use uh, a recovery period in operating rooms and less contact with uh other patients and stuff for the uh, operated patients and what i say as a last word for myself this period was very sad but anyhow a great experience for all physicians and we are all so used to count minutes even seconds to rush in our work but in this period we saw that not minutes in a hurry but hours in safety measures saved lives 
of our patients and ourselves. I hope this attitude will stay permanent after COVID pandemic. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. I would like to pass on to Dr. Jai and Dr. Yeah. Sudhir to ask the, to take up the questions of the uh, people, those who have left it on the YouTube or WhatsApp or, 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 or okay. on Facebook. So thank you, yeah. Jai. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chandra. We have some interesting questions raised in the YouTube comment section. Now, I think uh, any other panelists can comment just like that. What pre-medication you advise for children uh, operated? Yeah, yeah, we have made the we have made the delegate to stay longer. Please take yeah. their question first, yeah. and then the the, the, the um, panelists can discuss them. Yeah. Them. What yeah. pre-medication you advise for children operated under general anesthesia for cataract? Can I answer. I, yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Why are? Yeah. Why are? Okay. No, you were muted. Okay. Who's going to answer? Uh, can I answer, Dr. Jay? Yeah. Um, ketamine may be the good drug of choice. Why? But it got good sedation and uh, uh, it makes the patient, child calm and quiet. Right, Jay, anybody else yeah. would like to answer? Uh, Dr. Reno or Roya, any other two comments yeah. about it? It's, it depends upon your usual practice because in our place, we used to give intranasal midazolam, but nowadays in COVID area, intranasal midazolam is not to be given and oral midazolam is not available. So we are giving dexmetidomidine oral as well as intranasal. So nowadays for this COVID time, I will say dexmetidomidine oral is a good pre-medication and child comes sedated into the OT, but it takes at least 40 to 45 minutes for the action. That is the, so your patient should be there in the preoperative room 45 minutes before the administration. And ketamine can be used if you want to take the patient early into the OR. But is okay. it safe, Dr. Renu, yeah. to give Dexmet for small children? Sir, it's safe. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Renu uh, and Raja. Yeah. Um, limit, the, limit the answer from different people because you may have a lot of questions. Yeah. I've got one question coming on my WhatsApp from okay. Birmingham. Yeah, please. It's Dr. Dr. Sashi Bora. And this is a very, very small, quick question. She's saying that there are a lot of people who use the Honan's balloon. And she thinks that Honan's balloon should be clean uh, with antiseptic wipes or traces of blood may be lurking onto the Honan's balloon. Is anybody would like to answer anything on yeah. that? Will you use yeah, and what do you do? Yeah, in the Indian scenario, I think most of the eye institutions are not using that Honan's balloon, sir. Yes. I think, uh, yeah, we you just use the digital massage for the block and then proceed with the case. We never use it. I think, to my knowledge, in the Indian scenario, we never use that Honan's balloon. What about Tom and uh, Oya, any comments? Um, actually, what we did um, around during this period was to stop using uh, reusable uh, anything. We always use disposables. So Honan's balloon is not a disposable item in our uh, operating theater, so we stopped using that one. What about okay. uh, any other okay. panelists? Take another uh, question, Jack. You, you, you answer Okay, answer. okay. So that is an interesting question. Uh, uh, do you recommend UVC light in the OR between cases? Uh, yeah, Jai, we have one system. The UV rays, we put it in this AC uh, duct. This is not in the inside the theater where the blower is starting where they developed some UV rays and they set according to the flow of air. So we tried some of these things in our hospital. The UV lights are put in the AHE room, where the humidifier room, where the flow, of, according to the flow of velocity, we <coughs> develop. We are working on that. Okay. It is also, uh, we have also installed this UV in the AHU. Yes. Okay. Okay. Multiple places. Okay. Now, next question, I think ophthalmologists will be able to take on it. 
should we be doing routine cataract surgeries? Uh, Dr. Girish, would you like to comment upon it? Yeah, <clears throat> so I think uh, depending on whether you're in a red zone, uh, orange zone or the green zone as for the uh, regional differentiation, depending on the ICMR guidelines, you could. So people in the red zone may be a little cautious while taking up elective surgeries, especially for non-emergency cases, whereas people in the green zone or the orange zone can take up safely these cases, provided obviously you have triaged the patient very carefully and seen that they, they are not uh, having influenza-like illness or uh, not high risk contacts. Okay, thank you. Can I, can I just ch chip into that one as well? So uh, in the UK, we, we have to um, give uh, the, the prior prioritize our cataract operations. So the only ones we're allowed to do are the ones in whom they're going to either you irreparably lose vision if it's not done, which is certain um, glaucoma patients, um, or if they're at uh, risk of you know, falling and injuring themselves because the vision is so poor. That's pretty much it. Um, and as I said before, when we decide whether or not they want to come in, there's always the discussion of risks and benefits of surgery. And there's also the risk of catching and spreading COVID as well to be discussed. Okay, thank you. Then again, I think Dr. Girish can uh, take on it. How about oculoplasty operations? Yeah, <clears throat> so I think the uh, Oculoplasty Association has come out with guidelines. So definitely the risk uh, of um, non-emergency ocular plastic surgery, especially which requires a lot of drilling, which is a very potent uh, aerosol generating procedure or extensive use of potteries, there will need to be uh, postponed to such time that uh, it can be taken up safely. And if it does need to be done, then it's safer to get the COVID test done for these patients and actually ensure that they are COVID negative and then try and uh, modify your operation theater techniques to such a way that you are in, in a way able to isolate the surgical field with the use of plastic drapes around the patient's head. It, it would be a little cumbersome, but uh, that could be done in worst case scenarios. Okay, thank you, thank you. Then uh, again, a question Dr. from Dr. Doc I think Dr. Tom wants to say something. Oh, please. Okay, no. Okay. I think, Tom, this is for you only. All is right. FACO an aerosol generating procedure? Well, I think I've answered that one earlier on, isn't it? So, yes, it does generate aerosols. The aerosol seems to be coming just from the fluid that's uh, running through the eye. Um, so, United Kingdom Royal College of Ophthalmologists are now saying, yes, it does generate aerosols, but it's, it's a, I think the word is a low risk for infection. I think I had it on my slide. What do they call it? Um, uh, not an infective aerosol generating procedure, I think they call it. So, but if you if you put viscoelastic on the cornea first of all, um, and just rinse through irrigate aspirate before you turn the FACO machine on, then any there should be number one, there should be no um, aerosol, and number two, if there is a tiny bit of aerosol, it'll just be the fluid you pushed in. Uh, Povidone iodine first. Oh, thank you. Then uh, this question is open to all panelists. It is from my one of my colleagues. Do you recommend betadine gargle for all our GA patients? <laughs> I'm very sorry. Uh, so far, I haven't tried this. Uh, mostly, right now, we are taking GA cases only for the pediatric age group, right now. That to use trauma or emergency cases. Uh, I haven't tried in this type of venture. Maybe very palatable yeah. betadine is available, then it will be good. Okay. But in Europe, we don't uh, use it and it is no recommendation. We can okay. do a randomized control trial on this. Okay. <laughs> then, okay, moving on to the next question. For GA, you use LMA or endotracheal tube? So, yeah, please. Uh, can See, uh, I still have that uh, LMA is little comfortable for me. In the sense, uh, I use the glove with the hole in the center. After the LMA incision, I cover this mouth with the what we are using this uh, mask of this the three layer and then close this whole area. So if at all any leak is there, it is prevented. So I feel the... In 
insertion also we can make some distance some far away from here we need not go and close near the vocal cord and also the extubation is also very smooth so if properly sized and if you properly plan with the good plastic sheet and the good uh, size of the lma and cover with the mouthpiece with the plastic sheet it's still i believe it's much safer dr ravi chandra one thing uh, are there any studies to show that uh, this lmas are safe in the short procedures no i explored all the things the studies has not yet but they say we can but uh, studies are not yet come can i make a I... comment jana sorry yeah, okay go on chandra then i will comment there are what what the studies are is that when you place the lma which has been done by dr vanjundar from vanjundar from brisbane and uh, i have been a part of some of his publication is that 70 to 80% of the laryngeal mass don't sit properly so in the normal situation that's fine because you get away either you ventilate or you give more anesthetic and you get away but it is an aerosol generating problem yes so i, I might like i i just love laryngeal mask i you know I don't get me wrong but in the situation when you when if i got a i even a minute chance that this patient might be positive i, I would not like to use it i would rather go for this one so there is no question of right and wrong i think what you feel comfortable and you can defend yourself at the end of the day i, I don't think that there is a debate anywhere you know the a uh, gold practice golden practice would be intubate ventilate that's what you need to do that's what everybody is saying and laryngeal mask if you are using it be sure that the patient is not covid positive okay you can use mm-hmm. so, can, I, can, I, can, I, can i add a, yeah can yeah. i add a, yeah uh, okay um i think the most important thing here is not good and bad maybe not the best or the worst the most important thing is the what is your institutions regulations or policy about it because this is the only thing that will uh, protect you if anything happens if anyone sues you that that you use something and something happened an infection or some anything else then you can say that the institutions policy told me that you will not use lma or you can use lma this is what we do at our institution our policy is not to use lma during this period i cannot say that i don't miss lma i love it and i miss to use it however if it's not uh, appropriate we will use this policies to cover what we do thank you uh, i would like to just say a few sorry, things this um, one dr renu uh, now there are small procedures uh, uh, like putting an lma and we do to have to do so in this condition what is the best way to do because we we have we cannot put endotracheal we can put we can put endotracheal too but it will take a, at least half an hour or uh, 20 minutes to recover the patient and the procedure is only 3 minutes how are you doing now uh, to all, all the panelists how are you doing that sir, examination sir, sir there are two things if the patient is confirmed covid positive then even for 3 minutes you should use endotracheal cuffed endotracheal tube but if the patient is confirmed covid negative i would like to use laryngeal mask airway because what i presented is what are the guidelines which were given in the literature but we are using laryngeal mask airways even for one hour surgery we uh, we are very comfortable there is very smooth extubation because aerosol generation whatever is said in the literature is during intubation but if you have a good muscle relaxant or if you have deepen your anesthesia then there is very little chance of coughing and bucking during the intubation so if you are using intubation box or plastic sheet there is very less chance that that aerosol will come to you and if you are using ppe also then also it's very less chance that uh, you are getting infected by that so okay, yes i will say that i will use laryngeal mask airway more than the endotracheal tube for 3 or 4 minutes case or even half an hour case if the patient is covid negative yeah but chandra oh. can i make one final comment yeah uh, i think that the the, the, the debate around the supraglottic airway will go round and round i think that given the appropriate situation the right patient and knowing the covid status of the patient we routinely do a covid test within 24 hours of surgery 
give you some degree of reliability that the patient may not be uh, a high risk for the uh, operating personnel. And uh, taking into account the type of surgery, the length of surgery, and the, pa and the examination of the patient's airway, I think a supraglottic airway is appropriate. You have less chance of coming in direct contact with the uh, oral pharynx. And is, on top of which, one important consideration as, as we apply is that patients who do have a laryngeal mask airway inserted, where far as possible, we maintain spontaneous respiration. We do not assist respiration in those patients. Okay. I think uh, with this, we'll finish with the endotracheal tube and LMA debates. <laughs> <laughs> now, moving on to that uh, next, one more interesting question. Uh, one of that, uh, Dr. Saptish wants to know, during this time, my suggestion is to do away with the supplemental oxygen for local cases wherever feasible. That is, he exactly. said, means that the nasal oxygen, whether to continue to the patient for regional anesthesia or better to avoid it because Professor, can i answer yeah, yeah please yeah well, i think it's personally my sorry somebody wants to go ahead yeah no no please go ahead okay and my personal experience is uh, that the, if the patient is uh, you know tolerating a regional block very well and not very anxious if we minimize the sedation. I think that's uh, another yeah. thing. Either we should avoid the sedation and minimize the sedation. If patient is saturating well, not issue, then we should avoid the supplement oxygen. And I, in last couple of months, done loads of cases, which normally protocol was that uh, given the sedation and given the oxygen, we've gone away of those ones. So it will, it will be helpful. I, I agree. And uh, I hope the same view of the panel is. But where the patient is, uh, you know, a lot of comorbidities and oxygen dependent, then you have to give the oxygen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mukhtar. I just want to add a comment. It is mainly they say that high flow of oxygen to be avoided rather than the low flow. I think it is mainly the flow which we kept that should be focused upon. So I think we should yeah, go with the low flow of nasal oxygen. Yes, I one question. Gave, but the problem is, sorry. You said this over the three layer mask, you put some uh, oxygen. What is the flow that you plan that? Flow of oxygen. Or you, you showed some uh, over the face mask, you applied this uh, oxygen tent or something like that. Yes, I use two to what three liters. I use two to three liter per minute oxygen. Okay. Um, then one of the other question is, while we practicing in nursing home setup, you will not get a closed circuit airways. What is your take on it about doing GA cases on open circuit? COVID negative, happy. Otherwise, any other? So I think then some of the questions from Facebook, I would like to add upon now. Is it safe to use FFP mask during FECO? Is it safe to use? I think it means that filtering face piece mask too during FECO. Okay, yeah, that, that was one of my slides, I think, wasn't it? So um, the evidence is now evolving. Um, as I said before, the aerosol is thought to be a non-infective aerosol. Certainly in the United Kingdom, the rules are if you want to wear an FFP3 mask, then they're not going to stop you. But it, it's really um, you know, surgeon preference and, and team preference. But it seems like the normal mask is actually OK for, for, for FACO. And that's what we're doing here in Norwich now, as of Thursday. OK. So... Just going through any other questions. I think, I think Chandra, I think uh, if you want to add upon anything. I think Chandra has gone offline. Uh, yeah. We lost Chandra, but he's rejoining, I think, according to what's Okay, up. to summarize, we have come to the end of the Congress. Today, we had a very useful discussion, mainly covering perioperative management of patients posted for eye surgery during this COVID times. So we discussed about special investigations required, operation theater requirements, choosing anesthesia technique, which is safe, 
both for patients as well as for the operation theatre staff. Changes happened in pediatric ophthalmic anesthesia and not last but not the least the issues regarding the post-operative management of patients. So any other comments to add upon panelists? Just a big thank you to Jay and to Chandra for organizing all this. I, I think it's very yeah. useful and uh, it will be good to have another virtual meet in the future, I think. Yes. So thank you, everybody. Excellent work. Thank you. Excellent no. work. Thank before you very that, much. Before the Congress usually ends with some cultural show. So for a change, let us also end this virtual meet with a cultural song. Dr. Sudhir, can you just put on this song for us? Just give me a minute. Yeah, please. So let us also finish this uh, virtual meet with a cultural program. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Jay and Dr. Thank Chandra. You. Thanks again. I'm looking forward to the song. <laughs> Good to meet everyone on this Zoom again. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Nice to see everyone. Yeah. So, you know, I'll just say, uh, uh, yeah.
thank you dr sudeer thank you thank you yeah i will uh, i'll just end the live streaming so thank you all for uh, thank you thank you